One of the questions I always like to ask skeptics of various stripes is, what is supporting your doubts? In other words, what belief is supporting your doubts? You can't raise questions unless you're standing on some kind of ground. So what is supporting your doubts? Hello, and welcome to Thinking Out Loud. I'm your co-host, Nathan Rittenhouse. And I'm your co-host, Cameron McAllister. And today we want to talk about uh, a Peruvian podcast that Cameron was on, talking about the appropriate role of doubt and how we think about that as people of faith and in our own spiritual journeys and formation. I think Cameron had a couple aha thoughts after that that he wanted to bring in here, and I think this will be a, a helpful thing for us to kick around. But first, before we get to that, two things. One is the most exciting thing that has ever happened, according to Nathan, for listener responses wow. on the Thinking Out Loud podcast is not one, not two, but three people responded with hydrocarbons that were their favorites over the weekend. And so let me just give a shout out to Olivia and to John. Now, Olivia and John, this is I think you'll find this interesting, Cameron. Olivia and John both picked molecules based off of their symmetry and mm -hmm. what they looked like. So that's going on there. So I think what Olivia said, cyclohexane and benzene. And then John said he likes the saturated rather than the unsaturated ones because of the, again, because of their symmetry. Mm. So there's an artistic flair. I thought Cameron would appreciate that. There's the aesthetic appeal of the molecule that became the favorite for some, but I'm going to have to give the winner of this unofficial contest. And it's a little bit of a cheating because Melissa has a PhD in chemistry, but she picked linolenic acid, which is a fatty acid, part hydrocarbon, part fatty, or part, yeah, um, kind of a hybrid there. But she picked it because it tastes good. And I thought, ah, oh, you know what? Mm, that's that's another good, so it tastes good and it stores energy for your body. But she did note that it also looks like a scorpion when you draw it out correctly. So there you go. I, and it just makes me happy. I knew we had listeners who would pull through on this. And uh, yeah, there's some, there's some nerdy ones out there. And I appreciate you all. Um, but everybody universally said, even if they appreciated organic chemistry, it still was miserable. So I feel like we can bring that conversation to a close now. And uh, thanks for those of you who participated. It was a real delight. Um, second thing, before we get into the topic of today, uh, I'll be speaking in Mannheim, Pennsylvania this weekend, October 23rd at Chickie's Church. Uh, you can find that online or send us an email at info at toltogether.com if you want more information on that. And Cameron is speaking the next weekend. Where is that location, Cameron? Yes. Greenville at the, I think it's City Presbyterian Church. We had a link to it in our last episode. I will, I'll put, I'll throw the link back in there again, cool. but that's for the C.S. Lewis Institute. Yeah. Okay. Well, so now back October around 29th. to the order of the day. Um Fill us in on the conversation that you had with our brethren in the Southern America and uh, give us a little context of what was going on there and um, mm -hmm. set the stage for the questions in the, in the line of, uh, yeah, conversation that you guys had there. Definitely. So Andres Vasquez is a friend, an acquaintance. I've, I've actually, you know, true to 21st century life, I haven't met him in person. I was in Peru probably about six years ago, I think it, it was now, but I, our paths did not cross at that point. But he's a wonderful gentleman continuing to do great apologetics work on the ground there. He's, a, he's also studying philosophy and theology himself. And I will put a link to his, to his show, his YouTube channel, actually, in the show notes. It's called Imago Day. But yeah, he, had, he reached out. And he wanted to talk to me about doubt. And so one of the issues on the ground in, in Peru, and he's sort of, I believe he's in the Lima area, one of the issues that, that, is hap that kind of crops up again and again is that a lot of church leaders are discouraging doubt. And so there's mm -hmm. a strong sense of guilt associated with when you, if you have intellectual doubt, particularly if you have doubt about your faith, Right. And so he really wanted to talk about that, the sense of guilt and shame that often accompany doubt. And then there's that, of course, the, there are the verses in James chapter one. I'll pull them up here in a second. There's one verse in particular that's often isolated and used as a proof text, an ostensible proof text against doubt. 
and basically, you know, the, this is treated as the text that names doubt as a sin. So that's that's what we talked about. But broadly, we want. He also, I mean, the first question he asked me was, "What is doubt?" And then we we began to. So I'll, let yeah. me let me say well, can, a few words can, there. Can I throw yeah, the? Can ahead. I back it up a second and just say? So do you think there's some co- cultural? particularities or peculiarities there that Mm -hmm. that 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 generate that because in some ways i can see i can make an argument in my mind both ways one of those being yeah i can see some just in some of the interactions i've had with that part of the world some ideas of power structure authority that kind of thing happening but on the other hand it's also a type of question that's alive and well a lot of other places too so i'm kind of on the fence of saying i don't know did Mm -hmm. you get a sense from your conversation of what like, is there a cultural element that goes along with that? Or what's the... Yeah, was this sort of unique to the, yeah. the context? No, I mean, I think broadly speaking, doubt is celebrated and venerated outside the church. And then inside the church, it's, de- it's often feared. Hmm. And so that broad breakdown tends to hold true internationally as well. There'll be some... Sometimes, so for instance, I'll give you, I don't know if this is the case in Peru, and this would have been an interesting question for me to ask Andres, actually, you know, what are the, you know, are there some unique features to the questions on the ground where you are regarding doubt? But I did, so I do remember several years ago, so the the new atheists, right, were all the rage for a while. What, I mean, what would be the, the dates where they were really... I th- probably post 9-11 would have been the real most influential period, right? Of, yeah, but I by mean, that's 2012, when... like they were struggling to pull off gatherings in London and that kind of thing. So you probably had a exactly. decade there. So, that, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, because I mean, post 9-11, Sam Harris writes letters to a Christian nation in, in the wake of, of the Twin Towers falling down. And then, you know, the the God, of course, you have the four... The, the four Horsemen of the New Atheism, right? The yeah, yeah. Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, the God Daniel Delusion. Bennett, um, yes, and Chris, and the late Christopher Hitchens, who was, I mean, don't take this the wrong way. He was, he was my favorite. <laughs> <The key>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Christopher Hitchens had an absolutely acerbic wit, and I mean, he could be quite crass. He was a wonderful writer, by the way. Anyway, that's a total. Do you think aside. he seated stuff but, better than others, though? Like, did he feel less dogmatic I, to you? Well, I mean, or, he, or of course, how, I, mean, he, I mean, the subtitle of his book is why, Reli- you know, how religion poisons everything. So that's, <laughs> I don't know if the publisher foisted that on him, but that's pretty take no prisoners. But I will say this, here's what I loved about Hitchens. There was a high degree of honesty, an unsparing honesty to him that I did find admirable, especially as he was in his, you know, the later stages of cancer when he was, he was a man who was dying and he he just wrote so candidly about that and that was so he was quite brave i thought and again he just he was just a terrific writer but, so did those guys generate yeah. doubt or is that a different category well no so i think they did for a while so what i was going to say was their they kind of their influence wanes dramatically and you know by as you said 2012 2013 they're struggling to even get people to sign up for the events that sort of thing but in the you know on the continent in a lot of the countries in Africa for instance they're just getting discovered and they're just getting they're just getting really popular and at one point several years ago i think in in peru my dad was doing a lot of mission, a, a lot of work in peru a lot of apologetics trips the new atheists were really popular there hmm. and so that discrepancy between you know on the one hand they 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 were they had their they sort of had their shot now they're done over here and they're you know in the UK and in in Europe and in North America, but here in, in South America, suddenly you know they're now they're really big and there's this huge explosion. So there are sometimes those discrepancies, and that'll change the nature of some of those questions. I do think that they the these gentlemen were the you know caused a lot of doubt for some people because they were hugely influential. They had major platforms. They were writing bestsellers, and to a certain I mean, I'm going to try to say this in a non-condescending way. I mean, but to a certain untrained ear, or, you know, if you're a college freshman, they're quite persuasive sounding. In fact, I, I still think, I mean, it, rhetorically, these guys are, especially somebody like Sam Harris is a very is also a very gifted speaker and provocateur. And I mean, we could, 
I, you and I have discussed before the debate that he did, I believe it was at Notre Dame University, against William Blaine Craig. And I think <laughs> the rigor and the precision of the argument, Dr. Craig is the clear winner, mm -hmm. but in terms mm -hmm. of <laughs> rhetorical prowess and persuasion of the audience, it's Sam Harris and by a landslide. So yeah. I think those I guys did have said some William power. William Blaine Craig wins arguments. The problem is nobody understands that he did. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, I th I think there yeah, there there are sometimes those those noted discrepancies between what, you know, what popular, you know, what are some of the popular forms of unbelief and who are some of the popular skeptical thinkers, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Can I say something about you're talking about the rhetorical genius? I always thought that reading the New Atheist was a little bit like eating a bag of potato chips. Like you got this thing that's big and puffy <laughs> and shiny on the outside yeah. and then you pop it open and you're like what like all these little pieces in there like the contents may have settled <laughs> and it's one of those yeah. things where i think as part of a diet it's fine and it's good to engage with now that if that was your entire diet you'd probably die of something and your faith would too so i guess i always had a little bit of a uh there's not as much in this once you pop it open and look inside at the crumbs sort of feeling and uh, and a real feel like the contents really did settle once you pushed into the arguments in a way that I'd never felt it as a deeply threatening. Um, mm -hmm. I, I thought actually, I, it's a weird way my mind works. I think sometimes you do need people asking those questions to get you to ask questions about the, the foundations of where you're actually at or where you're coming from or how you got to what you believe. So uh, I think the people who read the God delusion, there, I'm sure there was a, a whole crew who said, yep, that, that's it. I'm done with the church. But I bet there was a whole nother crowd who read the God delusion and came out of the other side of it saying, if that's the best argument against what I do believe really yeah. does hold to be true. Sure. So there's a, a double-edged sword there a bit, I think. I think I'm sensing, you know what we should do? We should do a podcast on worthwhile atheists. What do we want to call it? <laughs> the best atheists? Atheists worth <laughs> your time? Because there are actually some very powerful skeptical thinkers out there. And I know that might sound a little nerve wracking, but they often will do you the courtesy of raising some of the best questions and also end up pointing to some of the most profound features of Christianity too, well, inadvertently, think, sometimes directly. I think as an example, Bart Ehrman did a world of service for biblical scholarship. I mean, yes, I know he's yeah. kind of a, a pariah name within the Christian world at his dismissal of things that we hold to be true, but he asked good questions that needed to be answered. And once those questions were answered, that put us at a better spot than we would have been without being poked probably. So that, I've got it. Atheists, yeah. we wish you were reading. Atheists, <laughs> we wish you were reading. <laughs> all right. We're I all think topic. we should do that. No, we're not. Anyway. Yes. Yes. But, but we, but, but I digest. All right. Let's talk a little bit about doubt now. So here's let me let me throw some stuff at you though, Nathan, here real quickly and see which gets your response here because I think it's important to talk about how doubt is not should not be a source of guilt. It shouldn't be something that fills us with with shame and constant agitation. But on the other hand, I do think that here in North America, Doubt is so celebrated. It just seems like every single week there's a new book that pours forth from the presses on the virtue of doubt and how it's okay. I mean, sometimes I'm a Christian. Maybe today I'm a Christian. Maybe tomorrow I'm not. I don't know. It's okay. But I'm honest and I doubt and I don't know. And, and this is sort of seen as a mark of authenticity and you know intellectual honesty. And there's something about that that makes me want to say yes, but let's let's recover a robust understanding of the real virtue of faith and the beauty of of actual faith and conviction. And also, let's recognize that doubt never stands on its own. So, I'll, the the few the intro the introductory remarks I made on that interview were, first of all, I was asked to define doubt, and I said, "So, all right, for the pur purposes of." of this discussion, if we're talking about doubt as it relates to our faith, I define doubt as intellectual uncertainty. And there are various varieties of that. There are various, you know, forms of, it can come in very severe form. It can be, you know, mild, but, you know, intellectual uncertainty. But then I, I did 
the old maneuver that I usually do these days, which is I I drew, I drew from our pal Leslie Newbegin, Newbigin. Because Newbigin, and Newbigin is drawing from his pal, Michael Polanyi. So in the gospel in a pluralist society, he is, he's, he's giving you basically um, a, a condensed version of Polanyi here. But he says that doubt always depends on a prior belief. This makes perfect sense when you actually think about it. You can't, your doubt always is supported by another, a, a belief. It has to stand on a belief in order to function. You can't call something into, into question unless you're standing on some sort of firm ground. So for instance, if you say, well, I have a hard time believing in God because I think the natural sciences basically rule out the possibility of his existence. I don't have an ax to grind, but I think God is an unnecessary hypothesis. Okay, you're still resting on a whole slew of assumptions about the legibility of the universe, the fact that it's knowable, the fact that it's testable, the fact that it's reliable, an even bigger assumption, the fact that you have that your reasoning faculties work, that your your mind is trustworthy. All of these are huge assumptions. And if there's no God, for instance, and everything is ultimately re the result of a cosmic accident, then some of those assumptions become a little bit more problematic. The fact that you have a trustworthy mind, for instance, the, the fact that the universe is knowable itself, but you must make all of those assumptions in order for science as a discipline to even proceed. Can't get off the ground unless you assume that it's going to work and that you can know things. So I think looking at it in those terms because there's a tendency if if you if you're you define yourself as a skeptical kind of person to think that the onus is always on the other person and that you never have to provide any explanations at all or that you don't necessarily have a lot of faith convictions and beliefs that you're resting on but of course you are those faith convictions often unstated, often taken for granted, enable your doubt. You couldn't, you couldn't express your doubt without them. So I think that's a good place to go. I always say, if you have doubts, that's great. But what is supporting your doubts? That's a question I like to ask a lot. What are the yeah. assumptions supporting your doubts? So you've, you've laid out 50% of the, <clears throat> the Polanyi argument, I think there, <clears throat> excuse me, where, so one is like, yeah, what's supporting your like, what are your presuppositions about your perspective of reality that make that possible? That's one thing. The other version of the way in which doubt doesn't stand alone is, I've used the example, you know, if you say to me, I believe the moon is made of blue cheese, and I say I doubt it, I, I say I doubt it not just as an antithesis to your statement, but because I believe something else. So since I mm -hmm. believe the moon is made of something else, I don't believe that it's made out of blue cheese. So the the way that that idea you have there of doubt never standing alone is you only doubt things if you believe something else to be true. And so this is the heart, I think, of... Remember Andy Bannister's book, The Atheist Who Didn't Exist? That's a good one if you want to giggle and a chin yeah. scratcher all at the same time. But he has this whole thing about atheists having the same religious beliefs as a potato, which isn't true. But if you're going with a total negation of... To be an atheist means I don't have any religious beliefs. Well, a potato doesn't have any religious beliefs. So he would say, you have the same <laughs> religious beliefs as a potato. And, and that gets mm -hmm. kind of contentious in a hurry because nobody can have the same moral or religious beliefs as a potato. But he's poking at this idea that you can't just, you can't have a position that is just the opposite of a position. You have to say, I don't believe that is true because I believe this other thing is true. And then that line of thinking is exactly where what Cameron was saying comes into place. Well, why do you believe that that other thing is true? And are you not using a lot of the same tools that Christians use in supporting their belief in God? So we ha we're not making very much progress here. We're still just even talking about the nature of doubt. But that's important because I want to ask you this question, Cameron. Hmm. Is doubt the opposite of faith? Because in my mind, yeah. that's not I mean, I clearly think, that's yeah. the, the thesis antithesis there. No, it's not. And I think, biblically speaking, the opposite of faith would be unbelief. And mm -hmm. that's something else. That's something else entirely. Although that doesn't look like what you were, what you were, was that, where would you go with that, Nathan? With the opposite of doubt? Yeah. No, the op think, didn't you ask me the opposite of faith? Yeah. So, well, because I think 
most people when they're asking these questions are putting faith and doubt on this like teeter totter balance system of do I have more faith or do I have more doubt and trying to draw out mm -hmm. some sort of distinction of saying I'm a faithful person or I'm not. I think the part of it comes back into a theological foundation of saying, okay, so you're justified by faith, you're saved by faith. Is that a posture or is that like, oh, I need to have yeah. 16 faith units and then I'm saved. Yeah. And today I woke up and I have a question about something and therefore I only have 14 faith units and I'm going to hell because of my lack of faith units, which okay. is functionally how people are talking about it, but is not biblically the way that that works. No. And that brings me to one of the items I wish I'd mentioned in the interview, which I'll mention now. So let's define faith too, because one of the questions that I got gets to the heart of what you're, what you've been talking about, Nathan, basically that the question was, can faith and doubt coexist? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, right. So what's faith? So, and Nathan, I, you can, you can chime in here as well and, and build on this if you want, but for just for our purposes here, I would define faith as a combination. It includes knowledge, beliefs, and trust. So faith mm -hmm. is a combination of knowledge, belief, and trust. Now, trust is an inescapable element of faith, but knowledge, belief, and trust should make it clear that this is not a totally blind commitment. It's not a leap mm -hmm. in the dark. So for instance, let's go to the night of faith. Leap of faith, by the way, this is all terminology that comes to us courtesy of Soren Kierkegaard, and this is his great book, Fear and Trembling. Very rich and complex book. He wrote it under a pseudonymous name, and a lot of people run with what he says and basically say, Kierkegaard created this whole fideistic, problematic schema in that book. That's not actually what he was doing. He was trying to illustrate the radical nature of faith. I think what Kierkegaard was doing was totally legitimate, but it's complex and we don't have time to unpack all that right there. I like Kierkegaard. Leave him alone. But here's what I was here's what I want to say. <laughs> Abraham, when he is called upon to make this absolutely radical sacrifice of his son Isaac, okay, that is an that it, it truly is an unparalleled, unprecedented moment. This is where Kierkegaard famously raises the question, is there a teleological suspension of the ethical? But it's not a blind leap in the dark because Abraham is the, he's the friend of God. He has a very intimate and frightening relationship with the living God. And if you look through all of the stories of Abraham's life, even the the whole, I don't, it's hard to, I, I still have a hard time when I, when I read about his <laughs> negotiations with the Lord over sparing lives in the cities <laughs> that are you know, <laughs> slated for destruction. I mean, it's, it's just astounding. But there is, so all of those elements are in play there. There is knowledge. There's, there's intimate, deep, personal, relational knowledge there. There's demonstrate the demonstrated evidence of God's work that Abraham has seen as well. So he's he's got knowledge. Based on that knowledge, he has beliefs and convictions about God, his character, even when his character comes into question with, you know, let sacrifice your own son. So are there probably, I mean, are there doubts in Abraham? I mean, the other, the only question you could respond with, you could respond to that with a question of, was Abraham human? Yes. I'm sure he was absolutely, I mean, I'm sure he was rocked to his absolute core, but there's trust there as well. So, I mean, that's a example that is admittedly, you know, quite mm -hmm. extreme. But if you fought, I mean, look at, look at any of the other areas of your life, some of the most mundane tasks of your life from sitting in a chair to boarding an airplane all of those, you have faith commitments. You've got combination of knowledge and beliefs and trust. When you're on an airplane, you got you have you have some knowledge about but you about the whole about air travel and all of that. But you don't know it exhaustively. You're usually not on a first name basis with the pilot or the crew, any of the staff on the on the airplane. And yet you think you're making a perfectly responsible decision mm -hmm. to board this flight and entrust your life into all of the these hands of strangers. 
So that's that's what I mean by faith. So can they can it coexist with doubt? Absolutely it can. And does it make you a horrible person if you have doubts and they're coexisting with your faith commitments? No, it does not. Yeah, so the um yeah, I think all I would add to so you said knowledge, belief and trust. I think within that trust category, maybe maybe to use like a like the fuller biblical image in my mind would also include confidence and loyalty. So the trust confidence thing yeah. follows pretty carefully there. I think the confidence one is where you get into the idea of um, I'm being asked to do something that doesn't exactly make sense, but I'm confident enough in the character of the person doing the asking that I'm willing to do it based off of previous, um, which is why it gets, I think Abraham is upheld as a model of faith. He didn't have as much to go on as Israel later did. So then God would say, I'm the you know the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, look at what happened in their life. There's a test case here. But you also have to remember the powerful and intimate way in which God showed up in Abram's life. I mm-hmm. mean, that's not incidental stuff there. And so to say that what Abram was doing was a leap in the dark is not a faithful representation of what was that. There's right. really clear revelation from God happening in very tangible, intimate ways and even the existence of Isaac himself was a stake in reality that Abram could hang his hat on, so to speak. Of exactly, yeah, that right, yeah. the very birth of Isaac. Right, yeah. yeah. So, so there, there are these markers there that we look back on, and and so I think faith has a lot to do with our memory, in our in our uh, delving into history and what has happened in the past that gives us confidence of what. So. There's kind of like that systematic God laying out his resume, as it were, like, I promise this has happened. 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 You know, and you just do that a thousand times. And then, okay, we have this other thing like the resurrection of humans. Um, Is that a ridiculous thing to believe in based off of the past performance of the one making the promise? So we can have some degree Mm -hmm. of uncertainty about how that all works out. We don't need to know the details of it. But if we have a confidence in the character of the God who promises it, that is salvific because we believe that God will be the one who does the doing. Same same way Abram was saved, Abraham. He didn't know how God was going to fulfill all those promises. He just knew that God was going to be the one who did it. And so there are these like That's right. sca- yep. scales of degree, like the thief on the cross to whom Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. I guarantee you that guy did not have a detailed worked out theology of the atonement. Just right. guessing, you, you know, but mm-hmm. but it wasn't the the faith units that that guy had, it was the faithfulness of Christ to the thing that God asked him to do and the fulfillment of a promise that God made that enables us to do that. So there is a degree there of like, hey, I want to know about these things and I can lean into them and I have big questions and I hold those with open hands, but it's not necessarily, that questioning is not the same as doubting the goodness of God. Questioning is a byproduct of curiosity, not of disloyalty. And so I think that might be important for us to keep in mind here too, that there are people that wrestle at different levels with ideas yeah. as it, as it comes in and out of that. So. Well, and we see quite a bit of wrestling with doubts in scripture as well. That's what I love about the, just the sheer honesty of the word of God. So, I mean, Abraham, he screws up quite a few times there with regard to, I mean, especially with, so the one of the major tests of his faith is the promise that he will have a son by his wife, Sarah. <laughs> right. That doesn't stop the two of them from trying to take matters into their own hands. And it's a mistake. But the Lord is merciful and compassionate with them. But in the end, they wait faithfully and the Lord does fulfill that promise. Not within the timeline that they were expecting, but... The, the example I usually point to as well is, and I did on in this interview, is John the Baptist, because mm-hmm. it, that's, that's, that's still an astonishing one that bowls me over, how you go from John chapter one, where he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and then fast forward, he's in a prison cell, and we know this won't end well. It will end with his head on a silver platter, and he sends a messenger to inquire of Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? And Jesus gives him a very compassionate response. And it's not, it's not directly, yes, I'm him. Don't look anymore. It's, you know, tell John. And he gives him prophetic language that the blind receive sight, the lame walk, demons are cast out, 
And, you know, blessed is he who does not stumble over me. And Mm -hmm. it's an invitation for John to look beyond the circumstances of his life. I think that basic But also beyond the words of just Jesus, too. He gives them real things in reality to, to hold on to. Here's what's happening. Here's what I'm doing. Here's the kingdom of God advancing. Yeah. But I think that's the basic challenge to to us. A similar dynamic happens usually when so there are there are different kinds of doubts. I mean, we could spend a lot of time talking about this. There's a lot to say about doubt. I mean, there are doubts that are purely intellectual, and those are kind of fun in some ways. You know what I mean? Those are those are those are more motivated by curiosity. You want mm-hmm. to know more. You want to understand more. And sometimes when it comes, when that comes into conflict with our some of our Christian circles, it ends up we want to get into some of those fine details. So a lot of people who love apologetics, who discover apologetics, it's this sort of, it's this, I don't know, it's a kind of respite for them. Like, oh, yes, finally I can, I've met people who find these items interesting and actually want to talk about it and aren't afraid and don't want to push me away and say, oh, just trust, just have faith. But, you know, you want to get into the intricacies and and you're interested in some of the conflicts that maybe erupt. You're interested in, well, doesn't the Bible, you know, talk about how the earth is is not moving? Or, I mean, we have some, we have some problems here and you want to press into those details, that sort of the more intellectual ones. But then there are, I don't like the word emotional because it gets, it tends to not get taken with as much seriousness. Mm -hmm. People hear, well, you know, there's intellectual doubts. Those are serious. That's all about reason. And then there are emotional doubts. And, you know, those are all, those are all about feelings. It's important, but that's more of a pastoral issue. No, there's no neat divide there between your emotions, I think, and your thinking. So I like to call them existential doubts. But those are usually put money on you using that word. I'm so happy. Yeah, that's very on brand. (laughs) But yeah, so those, but the existential doubts are more serious because they do usually involve pain. They're usually occasioned by, you know, adversity of of some kind or another, the difficult circumstances of life that are just inevitable. The root I call Mm -hmm. them life's routine calamities, not to be cavalier or callous, but just because this is a fallen world and bad stuff is going to happen to you. It happens that happens to all of us. And so Many of us, I think the temptation when we're rocked to our core in those circumstances, it's sometimes we we can't see beyond them. And we we kind of limit our eyes only, our gaze really only to the disaster at hand or the crisis at hand when really we need to take a larger perspective. We, we need to, I mean, and mm-hmm. it takes work and discipline to do this, but you need an, you need an eternal perspective for those you, moments. You know, one of the weirdest ones, if you're familiar with this, love to get you to comment. The Life of David Brainerd was a biography that I read that like, ah, I don't know that that was helpful. Oh. There was something going on there where like God used him, but man, that dude it's lived pretty morbid. Torture, tortured, yeah. religious. And there's, there's something deeply missing there of the joy and the confidence that comes from the Lord's goodness in that of, so not a doubt in, God's existence, which, by the way, we want to point out when when Scripture talks about belief in God, it's not talking about the existence of God. That's assumed. Mm-hmm. It's about that God is good or that God has a plan. But this idea of like, but am I in the will of God? Does God love me? Am I saved? That kind, there's almost like a dark vortex of a way in which that yeah. ossifies into a sort of soul crushing. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. Is it just me, or do you, like when you think of David Brainerd, do you think like interesting, but there's a borderline no, like I, mental health thing there too, maybe. I don't know. No, I did think that. No, I think you're right. Because looking at the life, I mean, he lived, he lived I mean, I think the best word for it is a, a tortured existence and just a, mm-hmm. a pretty excruciating death. And, but also his, just his day to day was filled with so much psychological menace. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you can look at some of, you can look at his, his achievements and you can say wow how admirable look at that devotion but on the other hand i think you can you can look at that and also say there was there was a kind of morbid introspection that that colored everything that he did and and that is not necessarily i mean it's not healthy i mean let's let's face it if you're if you belong to christ part of what makes you distinctive is is not your <laughs> iron-willed devotion alone, but also a sense of joy and peace mm-hmm. about you. And 
that's where, I mean, you, you can read about that and you can feel a high degree of compassion because yes, probably I would say, yeah, the man was dealing with some severe depression and there were, there were, I think a number of different issues there, but yeah, all that to say, if, if you're in a, in a state of constant, yeah, agitation and that, that's, that's a, that's a sign that things aren't settled the way they ought to be. I mean, part of, Part of the beauty and exhilaration of walking with Christ is a sense of, I like, I like Nathan's word here, of steadiness in the midst of everything else maybe shaking. And even in some of those, those dark times, now that doesn't mean you won't experience serious pain, but if that's a chronic condition of your soul, I'm talking about emotional pain all the time, I do think that's a warning sign. Yeah. You know? do- Don't you find, I think if you're somebody listening to this and you're saying, yeah, I find myself on the cusp of that sometimes, I think the Psalms are profoundly helpful here. Um, So if you're saying, is it, you know, does it offend God to ask questions? Um, Read the Psalms. I can think of about 150 counterexamples right there, you know, of, of deep wrestlings with what is going on. Why do the wicked prosper? Why am I suffering? Mm -hmm. Why are you silent? Those types of things are all biblically speaking sp- speaking interwoven within the fabric of what it means to be part of the people of God. So there's that going on. So let me open the door for that. On the other hand, I think a lot of our modern maybe this is what some people would experience pushback from the pulpit against doubt and questioning is that questioning is seen as a threat to authority. And I would change my mm. tune pretty quickly here and say that if you're under an authority that's unwilling to answer questions, that's probably a red flag for me of saying that person Mm -hmm. is seeing your perception of their position too highly uh, as far as like the foundation of what you believe and what you should be doing with your life. So I think there's a false elevation of humanity within the structure of what it is that we would have confidence in and that our certainty would come from. So I think that threat to authority element is alive and well in some places. And that very much needs to uh, don't hear us giving any uh, love toward that structure, I think. But, and that's a whole nother podcast perhaps, but mm-hmm. I think we do have to come back around to James Cameron because people would come back and say, look, here's a biblical precedent for um, kind of furrowing our eyebrows at the concept of doubt. I have some thoughts on that, but I don't know. How, did you guys jump into that one or how did that work out in your conversation? Well, the way the way it was brought up was just, what about James 1, 6? So I'll just read you 6. <laughs> But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That's James 1.6. So I'll kick it over to Nathan here in just a second. But I I did begin by saying, well, always be wary of somebody who takes one isolated verse, gives you no context whatsoever, and tries to use that as the definitive proof text against something. So it's very much the question of, okay, that's one verse situated in the chapter. Why is it there? What's it doing? And very important to understand what doubt actually means in this context and how that word is being used. You know, the basic, I think people, some listeners may have heard, if you've ever studied theology, this will be old hat to you. But if you haven't, it's worth it's worth hearing this. The hermeneutics, you know, the art and science of, of interpretation, the rule of thumb in hermeneutics is context, context, context. <laughs> Just like <laughs> real estate is location, location, location. So, yeah. yeah, what's the context? But anyway, that's that was the question that was. That's the that's the verse that's mm-hmm. apparently used quite a bit. So, Nathan, yeah. I'd love to start off with you there. Well, I think that's exactly right. We don't read scripture like it's the Quran, where every word or combination of words or mm-hmm. standalone half sentences mean something. Um, the context is really important. In the context of James, he's talking about difficulty producing endurance and that being a good thing and God providing for you so that you don't lack anything. But if you do lack wisdom, ask and it will be given to you. But when you're asking for it, don't don't have this double-minded posture. It's interesting to me that the idea of doubt there uh, that same word is used multiple other places in the New Testament for judge between the diakrinos, the, the uh, decide between two options and make a judgment there. <clears throat> and it's extolled as a good thing by Jesus many times 
or he has a high degree of expectation of saying, why can't you decide between these two things? Um, this is clearly good and this is bad. And so he's very hard on people who don't make that judgment call in the right way. I think what's happening in James, supported by the context and the way that doubt has talked about other places, is, and I'm guilty of doing this, so I, I see why he wrote this, is that oftentimes I think when we're in a posture of discernment or decision making, I say, okay, I have three good ideas for my life. And now I'm going to ask the Lord for his idea. And then I'll have four mm -hmm. ideas to choose from. Yep. And James is saying, no, that's not how that works. And you can read the rest of that, you know, for that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. God is not going to give you another option so that you have four options to decide between. He's saying, if you seek the Lord for this, do it with the expectation that what he says to you, you will do. Uh, so mm. it, it radically narrows your options down and it's not actually merciful of the Lord to give you an option that he knows you're not going to do anyway. Um, that has some bad consequences to it. So I think in the James one in particular, there's this idea of, um, not being flippant about like, oh, we'll just add in what the Lord thinks is another option among many. You remember the old, um, Hobbesian choice Hobbes, the, uh, is he the guy who in the state? Yeah. It was either the philosopher who started this or the guy in, who owned the stable in London. So this is like rental cars back before cars. And he had like mm -hmm. 40 horses. And so you had 40 horses you could choose from when you went to rent, borrow a horse. But the rule was you always had to choose the horse in the first stall. And so he rotated the horses through so they didn't get overused and could rest properly. So it looked like you had 40 options of horses, but actually you only had two options you could take the first horse in the stall or you could leave it. And, I, and mm -hmm. I think there's a little bit of a thing going on here like that of like, if this is clearly good and is of God, don't cast that lot in among other options, but be committed to that kind of faithful confidence and fidelity mm -hmm. that the word faith implies throughout scripture. Be confident, hold firmly to that. So I think that's more what's going on here with this idea of, of doubting is not prioritizing what God gives that clearly should be, we should clearly be able to discern as the good and the right thing to do. So, um, yeah, that that's different well, than saying, I'm not exactly sure how the resurrection applies to me. I got to figure that out. That's, that's different than, um, I'm not sure if what God says is good. And that is where, so right. testing is, is seen like testing your faith is okay, but not testing God. Remember that whole bit that's in Hebrews and first Corinthians about they came out of Egypt. They were being fed in the desert and like, Oh, if we're only been back in Egypt and the food was better and all of this. And God struck them down because basically whining, but of not being mm -hmm. able to discern that what God was doing was better. This is also in the unforgivable sin where Jesus, where Jesus is doing great things. And they say, it's because of the Prince of demons is because of Beelzebub. And he said, if you can't decide that what I'm doing is good and is of God and you're attributing good stuff to that which is evil, that's blasphemous right there. So this is mm -hmm. a real category, and it's something to really be concerned about, but we don't want to use the language around that that is happening in the New Testament and then apply that to having a moment of intellectual curiosity, inquisitiveness, mm -hmm. or just mental fatigue. And spiritual fatigue is a real thing. I don't know anybody that I know who has a deep faith who hasn't wrestled with it deeply and hadn't gone through serious moments of, look at the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Elijah comes off the mountain um, after the showdown with Baal, and then is like, it'd be better for me to be dead. I mean, just like that spiritually That is an astonishing exhausted. scene. Yeah. yeah. Then he yep. goes through the desert for 40 days. Here's the voice of God, and God says, go back. To the There's 80 days in the life of one of the greatest prophets where God spoke to him once, and he wanted to die because of mm -hmm. spiritual fatigue and weariness. So, I like, I just don't like, if you're going through one of those things, see it as a phase. I think that's one of the helpful things. There's yeah. a guy, my grandpa was counseling. He's like, well, I'm just going through a phase of doubt right now. And grandpa's like, oh, you're in such a good spot. He said, because you recognize it's a phase, um, you yeah. know? And, and so that's a real part of the finickiness of being human. But I think it's very legitimate to pray the prayer as I have done many times. Father, I am tired. Hold me. I'm sleeping mm -hmm. now. Um, yep. I see that as a legitimate expression of my faith, even with my kids. They say, I don't feel like praying. And I say, that's fine. Just say that simply, Lord, I don't feel like praying. Amen. Mm -hmm. I think yep. God honors that more so 
than trying to conjure up some sort of spiritual sounding something within us and is a is an authentic part of um human divine interaction and relationship yeah and on that note i mean if you can't pray if you don't feel like praying also just pray the lord's prayer there are praise prayers laid out for you. pray the psalms you don't have to reinvent the wheel there are prayers that are laid out for you that can really serve as wonderful aids to you and especially yeah and again i'll i'll chime i'll echo nathan here and say the the psalms you're at the heart of scripture there and there's a psalm for every season of your life i mean many times i've i have said lord will you hide your face forever not in those words <laughs> <laughs> yeah and not I, that I eloquently prayers um yes. also i think a lot of our best we, questions are prayers uh we see that from the psalms i think yes, you even listen to a so. public q a that's let me say one thing cameron and then i'll stop talking and you can close this out here but Historically, we have good foundation for this. You guys know I'm a hymnophile, but think about Come Thou Fount. That line in there, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. That's baked right in there. Or just as I am with one, out one plea. I was thinking of this the other day. We associate it maybe with like a hokey old school Billy Grahamism or an altar call him, and it's actually good for that. But listen to the third verse of that and tell me if this doesn't fit. Just as I am, though tossed about, with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears, within, without, O Lamb of God, I come. That just mm, seems to me yeah. to be a realistic prayer and posture of saying, my life is messed up, tossed about, conflicts, doubts, fightings, fears, within, without, I come. And so there's a real confidence in casting ourselves upon the Lord, even when we don't have our act together, that is a real part of where we're in a good position for him to work deeply within us. Yeah. And I think we will probably return to the subject of doubt at some point. It's just a really rich topic. And I would agree also, Nathan, I think when you look at the life of any seasoned believer, doubt and seasons of doubt are key ingredients in their spiritual maturity. So it need not be viewed as something that's deeply threatening. But thanks again for hanging with us through this discussion. You've been listening to Thinking Out Loud, a podcast where we think out loud about current events and Christian hope. Thanks for listening to Thinking Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, book Nathan or Cameron, or if you'd like to support us financially, whether through a one-time donation or on a monthly basis, you can do so on the donate page at www.toltogether.com. That's toltogether.com. And please consider leaving us a five-star rating and sharing this content with your friends. It really does help.